Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Aura Bora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Quaid from Bezel. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what is Bezel? What do you, what's your company do? Bezel is a marketplace for authenticated watches. The way it works, we have 400 million plus dollars in watches available on the platform. You go on the platform, whether you're on the site or you're on the app, you can find anything that you want. We also have concierge available for every user so they can kind of check out any watch and, and get support in that whole process. Once you find what you want, the watch is overnighted to us where everything is thoroughly authenticated in-house by our team of experts. It goes through multiple hands, whether it's an authentication specialist or it's a watchmaker. We're doing everything from diagnostic checks, time loss, pressure tests, and then we're also making sure everything was never reported stolen, and then ultimately overnighting it to you. So the goal is scaling the fact that you can find everything you want possible, but making sure it's super trusted and you're getting everything you want. So many questions I have, because I, I love Let's the space. It. I wouldn't say a big watch guy, but I would say mediocre. Just wearing a whoop like you. I love whoops because it's I'm a little bit more of a whoop than like an Apple watch because it still lets you still wear the, the watch. The re- that's and the data is better and everything. A hundred percent. And so when it comes to this market, and so obviously fake watches, are, fake anything are a thing. Fake yep. bags, fake watches. And so when you came into the market, what problem were you first looking at? Or what did you see? Were you like a collector? Would you have watches and maybe yeah. something bad happened? Or what was the problem you were seeing in the space? I think buying a watch because for most people, it's the most expensive thing they're going to buy. It's a really intimidating process. So... My specific story, I was at Google before starting the company. The first bonus I ever received, I, which maybe wasn't the rational decision at the time, bought a Rolex with it. And I just, as a kid, grew up loving watches. It was like this thing that I've always wanted to do. And then finally I got this tech job and I got the ability to afford it. And so as soon as that first bonus hit in January, I went out and buy a watch. And I, could, I think my naivete at the, side, at the time was I could walk into a Rolex boutique with the money that I looked up online for how much that watch costs and pay for the watch. In reality, there's like massive wait lists for these things. So you get pushed to the secondary market. And in the secondary market, it's kind of like you have to know a guy or you have to know someone or you're pushed to kind of these more generalist marketplaces or massive marketplaces. And it's up to you to shop the sellers and figure out what's real and fake. And the only protection you got as a buyer was you know, you could receive the watch and you could get it independently inspected and then you would return it. And I just felt really nervous and scared. So I also am a sneaker collector and my expectation going into it was like, there should be like a GOAT or a StockX equivalent. There's going to be some managed marketplace that's going to handle all the authenticity of it. And it's going to feel really modern and thoughtful and trusted. And that just didn't really exist. And so as a new watch collector, it took me a really long time to feel comfortable making my first purchase. Yeah, because you have to trust the secondary market. It's a whole can exactly. of worms, it's or it like, could be. I think the watch market tends to orient itself a little bit towards the existing collector. Like, all these businesses, and it makes like economic sense to optimize for these whales. Like, if someone's spending millions of dollars a year buying watches, like I'm going to cater to them before I were the first-time buyer. I think the our bet as a business is... Like there's a huge TAM expansion opportunity if we're able to build a product that the first time watch buyer feels comfortable with. I think kind of we're also building a better product for the existing watch buyer if we serve the first time watch buyer as well. But I think our longer bet is just if you build a better product for the first time watch buyer, they are going to stay loyal and you are essentially like, you know, establishing your security in the long term so that you are, you know, they're gonna buy your first watch, their second watch, third watch, fourth watch with you. So how did you first go about I mean, even the concept of authenticating these watches, yeah. is it is it easy? Is it hard? I'm, I'm being told today in the marketplace, there's so many fake watches and they're, so re- many, they're really yeah. good, which yeah. is, I guess, harder. And then I watched a YouTube video where there's literally like a jeweler guy. Yeah. And he's got all the tools. Totally. And I think on one, he couldn't really tell if it was real or fake, which I was like, that's kind of, maybe that's yeah. just a video for effect. But wh- no, how big are, is the problem? It's a massive problem. The amount of counterfeits that are happening every single year is, is super staggering. We re- released a report around a month ago, 23% of the watches that are attempted to be sold through our platform. And, and to pause for a second, like those are really, really top sellers, some of the best professional dealers in the US. 23% of those watches are flagged and they, and they get stopped by our authentication team. So if you think of that wow. perspective, like we are filtering down- That's crazy, that's a the lot. supply set already, picking great dealers. And then, and then still, what do you do? So let's, let's just pretend someone gives you a watch, a fake watch. They go, yeah. hey, authenticate it. Are they now banned or what's this? Like, it do- depends on the severity of it. And kind of a lot of the sellers like have no idea that happened. A lot of them, you know, it's not, I, I like to think it's like not, it's typically not a malicious thing. And it's a spectrum, right? Where it could be 
on the far side of the spectrum, like the watch is not real at all. Like all aspects are fake. It could be that, you know, the dial had been swapped and the dealer was completely unknown to that. It could be that, you know, the watch was just like not performing the way it should, where it's like if you bought a dive watch, for example, like a Rolex Mariner, but it comes into our pressure testing and it's not able to go in the water. Like it's, that's not a watch that you'd like to own. It's not really living up to the expectation of the watch that you were buying. Interesting. So okay. It kind of falls everywhere on that. Yeah. And we get crazy stories. That's like interesting. We, we've had watches that were reported stolen in like high profile samurai sword heists in London. And obviously like you don't want to own a watch that ultimately was stolen because you have no recourse if someone, you know, claims that that is their watch. Ultimately the insurance company can just take that from you. Did they lose a, did they lose a hand? I don't know. I don't think hands were lost. I think it was just a threat of a samurai okay. sword. But the way that we think about building our team is just getting the best folks that have kind of, you know, years and years of experience around this and having it go through multiple hands. So is there any technology associated with it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so the way that we think about our authentication is top of funnel and bottom of funnel. The top of funnel is basically at point of list. If you are a seller saying I want to list the watch on my wrist, you have to enter all the information about the watch, a number of photos, things like that. Someone on our team digitally reviews all of that. Oh, so interesting. Okay. the goal is that at the top of funnel, we should be filtering out the things that are blatantly fake with yeah. relative confidence interval so that as a buyer, I'm not even browsing on things that yeah. seem wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, that's super manual. Yeah. Like that is literally a human looking. That thing. makes sense. You yeah. can imagine though at like that stage, like a lot of interesting technology, computer vision, things like that. Like we're modeling all of that to make that more efficient. The second step is once the watch is sold, we overnight it to us. And so that is forever going to be manual. The goal is to like get very good at the top part so it makes the bottom part easier in the sense that like there's less things to check but there's just such a tactile requirement associated with authenticating these things we've our authenticators i'd say we i'm not on the authentication team our authenticators have blocked things because they didn't smell right like the papers didn't smell old enough for so example so it has to come with paper so you ha it, has it doesn't to have come... to come with papers okay. i think we, we have watches that are that are kind of a complete set if you would call that like watch box papers we have watches that just come with the box we have watches that are, are naked just watch only and obviously that fluctuates the value depending on the watch, but the papers are just one aspect of it. We're looking at all touch points of the watch, you know, taking a loop out, looking at all aspects of it. How does it weigh? How does it feel? Things like that. And then the run against the diagnostic checks, making sure it's performing the way it should and, and everything. So, so 23% of them are caught and they go away. That's awesome. What are like the one or two things that it sniffs out? Like these are the two things, these are the two traps. So is, is it, is it you, <laughs> the movement? Is it the way, like what's the thing that the, the people creating these fake watches get wrong more often than not? I wish it was super simple and I think it used to be different. Like it used to be more like you never see a movement that is the caliber of a real movement. However, like these fakes are getting so good that like the finishing on the movement and things like that is getting really close. I will say the, the level of precision associated with the finishing of these watches, the reason they these brands make so few of these things and they're in such high demand is is not just artificial scarcity. Like there's a lot of craft associated with the industry and in, in making these goods. So like when you get things under a, a loop or like multiple, multiple degrees of magnification, you can kind of notice the, the slight differences and things like that. Does your company ever buy watches or is it mostly? We'll market make selectively, right? Like we have a trade-in platform and, and, and things like that. But for the most part, we are asset light, which we first raised capital in 2021. Okay. And after COVID, during COVID, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Right. But that was a period of time when macro was kind of ripping and well, not even kind of certainly ripping. And the collectible environment was like very excitable. Yeah. And I think the feedback that we got from a lot of folks at that stage in the business was you should be taking on inventory. Like you're missing out on margin. You're going to make more money if you take on the inventory you can charge folks more things like sure. that like everything's up into the right they appreciate our bet from the beginning was no let's get really good at being asset light but still operationalizing the excellence of being able to get your watch within three to five days like making the process feel very you know hand holdy high touch mm -hmm. but we just don't want to take the inventory risk and then the market did us took, took a big swing watch market along with macro was down 30, 40%. So a lot of the businesses that were caught holding a bunch of inventory had to write that off. And we felt, you know, pretty good in that position. So. Yeah, that was smart. Let's talk about your cap table. You got a lot of amazing people on your cap table. Likes of Kevin Hart. You got Michael Rubin. Yep. I'm sure I'm not naming a bunch. Kyle Kuzma, who's on your website also yeah. with the Tiffany blue. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, we got Steve Aoki, we got Mike Lovitz. Entrepreneurs on this pod will want to know simple stuff. How do you get access to these people? Yeah. How do you meet them? How do you get them to invest? What's your advice to them? How did you do it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the way that it started was, and I was talking to you about this before the pod, like yeah. I'm a first time founder. My background is in, in, is in tech. My co-founder's background is in finance and, and, and also tech. It's like, so the way that we started this whole process was kind of a snowball effect. And I made a call out to some of the you know individuals that I knew that had started businesses in the past or were angels. Mm -hmm. I knew like three folks. One of them was Steve from Modern Animal that was on this pod uh, and is like a personal savior for me in, in many founder <laughs> moments. But it started there. We talked to kind of some angels that we knew in network. We got our first initial checks. Like a lot of those guys believed in us because we had stayed close to them. And then they segued into like the venture process that we had run. We got the first initial leads for our round. So Box Group wrote the kind of first big check in the round, followed by Quartzide and then Abstract Ventures. And then from there, it was kind of the fun segueing out and making these introductions. So I think John Legend was the first celebrity check that came in, which was like the biggest freak out moment I've ever had. I mean, I'm a huge John Legend fan. And then Kevin Hart came in and a bunch of Steve Aoki, a bunch of these cool people came in. I think the nicety that we have is just like we are selling watches. Like we're not a particularly complicated business. I would never profess that we are like doing anything that is particularly like nuanced and specialized and crazy, right? Like we're not an NFT business. A lot of these people like uniquely love watches. Yeah, Watches right. are a super popular category. And I think- It's like insurance for them in some way too, to be sort of aligned with the technology or exactly. a company that does and it. And I yeah. think like, I don't, regardless of who you are, I think all these watch collectors feel the shit. Am I going to get something fake? Like, am I going to, how do I trust this? Like, and we have investors and buyers that are in locker rooms and the NFL and the NBA and things like that. And they're, they're still like, they don't have like a watch guy. And I think my thought always with a lot of these like high profile individuals, like had a person that just looked out for them and, and that just doesn't totally exist. So I think they resonated with the problem and it kind of accelerated from there. So. I love that. You're kind of solving the problem that you felt as a sort of when you, when you first entered the market yeah. where you had to trust somebody and that totally. didn't feel good. And I think also like, I've never started a venture and had celebrity investors other than this, but yeah. I, I think what a lot of really awesome investors ask when you get them on the cap table in the beginning is like, how can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. So like Kevin Hart says, how can I be helpful? Or John Legend. I think the easy answer is always like do promotions for us, like get on social media and talk about us, right? And like these guys know their value. They recognize it like, you know, when a lot of these guys came in, we had raised like three and a half million dollars. Like we we're not gonna go pay their, that, that's how much it costs for any of these guys to, to do anything normally, right? Like, so the cool thing about our business is we didn't have to ask for that. The value add for these individuals for us is like, talk to your friends that love to buy watches mm -hmm. about why we're great. Yeah. And I'd rather grow slowly because we're getting a lot of buyers like genuinely interested from other buyers because our average order value is $12,000. Like we sell very expensive thing to be very low and allows us to kind of grow very organically that way, right? And so in the beginning, it was a lot of storytelling and getting a lot of these like nodes to cool collector networks in. Right. And certainly like Kevin Hart and John Legend are And it's are easy, right? Because it's like, yeah. oh, if you're a watch person or you're a friend of yours is, you can just say, hey, check out this. Yeah, and like yeah. We, we, a lot of our earliest partnerships, like we have, we're in the Equinox circle and we're a partnership with Equinox. We did a ton of events with Soho House. Like a lot of these cool brands, even in the early stages of our growth, which allowed us to kind of be aligned with those brands and kind of grow our brand alongside. We had these cool watches and a lot of people, regardless of their status and, and, and their economics and, and what they're able to afford, they love watches and it's super cool to be able to go up to it, show up to an event or host a dinner or whatever and have a few million dollars in watches that you've never been able to see before. And so that's been kind of like our unfair advantage in, in growing the business from a, like a cool factor perspective. Yeah. Do, do people ever just give you your watches like just to authenticate on the outside of the business? Is that something you guys do? We do that do? for like select clients. We don't have like a product sure. oriented around that. But yeah. I think, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, we have a concierge model and our whole thing is like really delighting customers by the fact that like you have a human in the office that knows your name that like is advocating for your collection. And so 
we just love to do things that surprise people. So if, if someone asks for some authentication or things like that, like our, we love to help out with that. And are you, are you considered like a SaaS? When it went to the valuation, what, how are you sort of, is it a SaaS company? What is it that you're modeling We're a marketplace. after? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the, we just take a commission on, on the seller side. So the, the buyer is not charged anything. Yeah. And then the seller, we take a commission out of the sale. And on the seller side, is it a person? Is it a jewelry store? Like how, what's the range of the people on that side of it? It's kind of everything. So the industry itself is like 90% professional. So most of the inventory is, is professional deals, which makes sense. Yeah. We're a bit less than that. It was obviously like to get the marketplace wheel spinning, it was easier for us to go to professional dealers, pitch them on a more transparent process, better payouts, things like that. A lot of the largest dealers in the U.S. came on as investors in the cap table in the early days, which was awesome because, as you know, in building a business, like you're not, what you're promising to do is not what you do on day one. Yeah. So we needed a lot of sellers to work with us there. Now we're at a place where like we are we are benefiting their business and we're selling a lot of their watches. So you know more sellers organically come on from there. We've spent zero dollars on a seller side acquisition, so that's been all super organic, and we just broke four hundred million in, in inventory, which is super awesome. Yeah, and so yeah, that's kind of in the way that we worked. And then once we had the watches and the buyers kind of kind of on come on board, right? Like ultimately, it allows us to be really effective with how we use our spend from a paid marketing perspective because. If you're querying Google saying, I want a Royal Oak 15300, our results should show up because we are one of the largest inventory sources now. When you think about this, so you started with watches, you brought up sneakers also. Do, yep. you, do, you, do you see a world where you guys transition into different products? I don't think so. I think like our bet from the beginning is we're a big fan of kind of these verticalized marketplaces and specifically in watches, like I wouldn't profess to say, like I think there's obviously a lot of crossover between like fashion and streetwear and sneakers. I think like StockX is a great example. They tried watches, they played in watches. I think they're really good at selling like the Supreme collab G-Shock kind of things like that there are a comparable purchase to, you know, I wanted to buy a pair of sneakers that are Supreme, so I'm gonna buy this and it's gonna be one big order. Yeah. I think with watches, like you wanna buy from an expert, you wanna buy from a specialist. And that presents itself in two ways. One, like I think from a customer perspective, it allows the customer to feel like these guys are the real deal, like they, they really care about this. And then I think from a product offering perspective, it allows us to build all of like, or obsess rather, of like all of the details you'd need to make an informed purchase decision. Like the product is entirely custom from the ground up to sell watches. And like our database is, we have 70,000 plus watches available from an inventory perspective from a mapping perspective, from a data perspective, like the goal is making sure it's very, very clear to a consumer that this product is obsessed about watches. And I think the watch market, which is probably similar to a lot of high value collectible categories like cars and art and things like that, the watch market particularly is very good at sniffing out something that feels disingenuine. And these collectors are obsessed with watches. And I think it would be doing us a disservice if we didn't project back that same degree of obsession with it. So for now, like, you know, we're super, super verticalized and focus on that. There's a lot of interest in kind of ancillary products around that. Like you can imagine like insurance offerings and other cool things that we can build around the product of watches. But I think for the, the rest of the business, we'll be watches. I remember, so we bought this building, it used to be a, a pawn shop. And so I was going through it we left all the stuff inside when we bought it. Yeah. And so we're going through the whole thing and there was clearly like a huge vault in there where they had the watches and they left all the boxes there. Yeah. So like empty Rolex boxes, empty whatever. And then there was a like almost a list. They had a list that they had print out of yeah. like this watch and the serial codes that were yep. made that year. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, that's how they used to authenticate this whole yeah. process was the serial code. That was, that's all they had, Yeah, which was nuts. And the paper was obviously like yellow. And so it was almost probably from like the seventies. It felt like, yep. you know, this antiquated thing. And I was like, that was it. Like that was the science. I when mean, it, like, <laughs> when it, and obviously looks and feel and stuff, but yeah. I was like, it was crazy to me that it, it could be that the, simple. The tech, I mean, like, like the technology hasn't changed that sure. much, right? Like sure. it's still a serial driven world like that is how you identify uniquely that this watch is this watch and that's how you match the papers to this watch and the methodology that's used to authenticate is still largely the same right it's like getting it in front of people who have seen thousands of these watches getting it in their hands allowing them the tools they need to look at everything in detail 
like spend an inordinate amount of time with these things. And then like the technology, sure, there's like pressure tests and time loss tests and those get better and more efficient, but it's fun because we were a technology business. My background is building technology at Google and like having that background. And so half of our business is engineers that worked at Google and Amazon and all these big companies in the same room with like people that our first hires is Ryan Chong. He was director of private sales at Sotheby's, the auction house, and he kind of built out our whole authentication team. We have folks from Sotheby's and Christie's and all the watch world and watchmakers and like true craftsmen. And that's the fun juxtaposition of the world that we're playing in where we're building these technology products and they should feel modern and thoughtful. It should feel when you're checking out, like it feels similar to buying any other modern product you would on any other modern app. But then we also have to have this very, like, not dated, but, like, we have to pay homage to the history that exists horologically to the industry. Like, it's, yeah. there's some things that just cannot be replaced by technology, and that is getting the hands of an expert on these watches. So let me ask you a question. So I remember six months ago, I was getting probably a deck every day around, like, Web3, NFT, all of this stuff. And so yeah. in part of these decks, a part of it was uh, going into the luxury fashion world. And so the, the point being... The yeah. secondary reseller market is massive. They had a dollar figure. It's huge. Not yeah. trillions, but definitely several billions. Yep. And in that world, they were saying, you know, what if you were an LVMH house or one of these houses yep. and you could just uh, barcode or Web3 or NFT essentially like a, a purse. And then that way you knew for its entirety yep. that this thing and when it's sold. And then the goal there being like a residual. So like a royalty would go back to the the big company every time it resold. Yep. And it was, and so I was looking at it I'm like, that makes sense. It's an interesting, in my head anyway, very logically, it feels like that could be, it's interesting. Certainly. Do I think fashion houses are going to end up doing this? I don't know. When it comes to watches, is that a threat at all? Is there, is like Web3 or them putting like a, tr I don't know, a tracker? Yeah. I don't even know what they could do, but is this happening? Is it not happening? It's certainly not a threat. I think like anything that changes how these watches are traded is just like, a new facet to our business and, and it's interesting. I'm happy you're talking about it at the manufacturer's level mm -hmm. or like the watch house's level. Yeah. I, I think like to what you're saying, like I think watches are always going to be behind fashion. Like it's much easier, I think, totally. given like the fast fashion nature of these things to like try this stuff, right? Like yeah. Rolex moves so incrementally slow and that's intentional. Like they're 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 so good at these things, but they, they make new drops every year. And for someone that came from like a sneaker or a fashion world, they'd be like, wait, that's this, that's the same watch. It just has like a new movement. Like, why am I, why is everyone freaking out? Everything moves so intentionally slow because I think the culture of watches is that like we've done it right. It's so craft, nothing moves fast. And like, that's by design. And I think that's some of the allure and like the magic around it. Right. Yeah. So I was pitched similarly, very like uh, when we started this business, so many <laughs> I can of these Web3 businesses. Even probably some of the tech people that you hired were like, hey, we should, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think it's it's like super interesting. And I think like if it's not from the manufacturer level, you still have this inability to tie a physical good to like the digital instance to it or like the on-chain instance of it, right? Like, and it just becomes a replacement to a piece of paper that is like sexier and like more like now feeling but it doesn't really solve a problem, right? Like you would still need some intermediary body to physically be like this watch. I looked at the serial, I opened up the movement. It actually does match yeah. this thing that's on chain. Like it doesn't solve the problem. We still have to exist, right? right. Yeah. And in a world where the manufacturers start like placing these things in the watch, I think it becomes more interesting. I still think like transactionally when the watch changes hands, like you still need a third party to confirm like nothing has been modified in this watch. This watch is still original. The movement hasn't been swapped out. Cause if it has some chip on the dial that says it came originally from AP, doesn't mean that I didn't swap the clasp out and it's now something out. Or I didn't swap everything else out, right? So you still need this this kind of body to do Which that. Some people do anyway. They'll swap something out just for personalization. They totally or, will, and, yeah. and and the whole thing. But just for, for fun, us, I mean, like yeah. Just, yeah. If you own a watch, change the color, and you want to do what you want to do with that watch, I think that is super exciting for you, and that is everything you want to do. Our whole thing is we only sell watches that have like truly genuine parts from the manufacturer, and we just want to make sure that everyone understands what they are buying. It is not fundamentally wrong. It's a personal choice if you want to like bust down your watch with diamonds, right? right. The problem is when that gets listed on a competitive marketplace and they don't mark that that's happening and someone buys it thinking it's factory diamonds and pays a premium for that, they just kind of got robbed in that transaction. Yeah. So that's the whole thing that we care about. It's just, we only sell things that are factory and, and come from, you no know, engraving nothing. 
Interesting. We, well, no, we'll sell things that have engravings and okay. things like that, but like, yeah. it needs to be blatantly clear. We've had multiple they cases where- They haven't touched where, the dial or the movement at precisely. all. Precisely. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. multiple that cases where a watch is sold through our platform. It gets to us. There was no engraving mention. It has an engraving. I think they're delightful. I think it's like a cool, like someone else owned this and now I get to write my own story. But we will cancel that sale at that point because the buyer doesn't want the engraving and they didn't know that, right? Yeah. What keeps you up at night when it comes to your business? What's the, <laughs> what's the hard part? I think every part is hard, <laughs> yeah, right? Like for sure. we're in this fun stage. But you have a two-sided market. Totally. You, you have growing inventory. That's cool. I mean, it seems like things are... Yeah. Yeah. We're, no, we're, you have we're knowns. In a, we're in a great point in the sense that like this year has been, certainly the latter half of this year has been like an amazing growth year for us. And the wheel started and now it's spinning really fast. And getting there was very challenging. And because it's just every single thing goes wrong. And like, I'm really happy we do everything in house, but every single day there's a fire drill where we want the sellers to be happy because the sellers are a, you know, a huge part of our business, but our ultimate goal is protecting the buyers and we'll get a watch in and the watch will have more wear than we expected the watch to have. And so we'll call it, we'll like, we don't want to pass it on to the buyer. So we have to contact with the buyer and like, but the seller's like, what do you mean? Like, course it yeah. does it's not enough you know so it's it worked perfectly it's a, we're always like it. going back and forth and our goal is to try to like make sure everyone is happy yeah and in the beginning it's like well you guys the whole, fix them if something we needs... have a whole watch okay. watchmaker and staff and, and things like that okay. right but like that isn't totally always scale totally, and like totally so it's we're at the stage it's of the friction. business where like we're doing the kind of paul graham style do things that don't scale like just delight everyone yeah. and i think now we're starting to figure out the stage of growth that we are are like we are, we are at. It's like how do you make that super scalable and 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 kind of continuable? So, Paul um, Graham had a great prediction for this year. He says wokeness will start to fade away. Yes, that's one of his that. tweets, and I yes. I retweeted that one. I was like, I fucking hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that's gives me up. I think like that's interesting. At least starting the business, what I didn't realize is how hard it is, and I think not enough founders talk about that. Like, I think. It is like the grind mentality is, is, is something that like I thought is really cool and I love that and I, that's just the kind of person that I am. But like it doesn't stop. There's not a moment where I don't wake up and immediately think about this business. And it's, it's like there's not a single day where it's not the last thing I do when I go to sleep is think about the business. And it's, it's all aspects from like how is the culture feeling internally? Like how is the team feeling? Is everyone feeling motivated to how are our buyers feeling? How are our sellers feeling? What's macro like? Like what's our runway like? How are we feeling about the next fundraise? When should we start courting investors to start doing that? Like it's a it's such a dance. And I think it's been such a fun process and a learning process. But we launched the business in June of 2022. We first raised capital in August of 2021. We announced like, an extension kind of, we, we, we did an extension and fused it with our initial round. We announced like an $8 million collective seed in January of last year. And so like we raised at like a peak, we had to survive like a, a pretty serious downturn. The goalposts kind of always keep getting pushed out. So it's like a weird way. It went from like an environment where you're raising for 18 months of runway to then an environment where it's like, if you're raising for less than 24 months of runway, you're crazy. And we were like, no one told us that. So. It was a lot of like learning process and things like that, but luckily the business is humming now and we're in a place where we're feeling really strong. So it's no, great. I'm glad you touched on that. It's so true. I mean, even for me as a developer, it's like if you build anything in your in like a community you live in or you spend a lot of time in, yeah. you'll realize like half the people hate you because you're you're just build you're making something better, right? And so mm -hmm. even though we're renovating a building that is basically an eyesore, totally, we'll get killed. We'll go to the council meetings. I'll get killed, and it's just like me taking abuse for two hours. Yep, and it just feels odd. You're like just you the only thing you expect from people is to be pro professional and they're not yeah. and so you're just constantly dealing with that yeah and some of those people matter you know totally. sometimes they have a voice or a microphone and you want them to speak well of your project and when they don't people read those news people read those articles oh, i am i am on trust pilot every single morning yeah. like i wake up i look at trust pilot and if it does if we don't have like stunning reviews from the day before like awesome. all that i'm doing that day is working with the team to make sure whatever anyone talks about, even if it's like a four star, it can't happen, right? Like, and especially at this stage in the business, our differentiator is trust and our brand is trust and like high execution and quality. We are in, we are, I just mentioned this, like our AOV is $12,000. We sell any watch from $2,000 to seven figures. Like we sold our, our first seven figure watch a month ago. What was it? Uh, it was a Tiffany Nautilus. Okay. Um, Those go for seven figures? They do. Wow. Yeah. Like the expectation is is and rightfully so. That's this is wild. why I started this business is <laughs> I'm going to buy 
the most expensive thing ever. I'm going to buy it on the secondary market. It should still feel like you're popping champagne and you're getting all the trust and you're getting everything there. But, but you're dealing with customers where they're apprehensive already. Like, they're nervous. And that gives you an opportunity to either, like, knock it out of the park and make them a customer for life or, like, be cavalier about it and treat it like it's a normal exchange and let them down. And yeah. I forget, like, whose quote this was, but the, the way that our team tends to live by it is there are two reactions when something goes wrong. It's either, like, the end of the world or it's totally fine. You get to pick one and the customer gets to pick the other. So we always pick the, awesome. this is the biggest deal ever. Yeah. It's so important. I can't imagine not solving this for you. Yeah. And that's been the way forward right now. And we're just at the stage now where like, you know, we're starting to figure out how to like really, really scale that as we're getting bigger and bigger. So are you guys raising soon this year? Yeah, yeah probably. You'll have to, right? Uh, yeah. We're in a good place from a, from like a capital perspective and okay. like we're selling a lot of watches, which is awesome. So, yeah. but yeah, I think we've intentionally timed the market so that we weren't raising last year. Yeah. And then I think this is the plan to come and go out and do that, that larger A that, that we've been delaying. So what are your favorite pieces? What are your favorite watches? What's Man, on your bucket list? It's so funny. And I love this question because it changes so much. Like we <laughs> yeah, started this, when you see them. Like, exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing, right? Like once you see them, it changes. It, we like started this business and, and I think my superpower in starting this business was that I had such an appreciation for watches, but like I wasn't like working in watches prior to this. And I think it allows me to empathize with the actual consumers we have. Like we're not, we're selling to some people that are in the watch world, but like for the most part, our consumer like works in banking or they work in tech or they, whatever it is. And like, they like watches, right? So it allows me to empathize with them in a very visceral way while still having the team that is like hardo watch knowledge experts. I get to see these things every day though. And it's like a kid in a candy store. And it's so fun. Like I went from being at my old job and having a monitor that just like looked at watch information all day and like nerding out about it to our authentication team sits next to kind of our main team. And so we're having a ton of these watches coming through every single day. And these are crazy pieces that like I've never, in a, I couldn't imagine seeing and like we're talking six figures, seven figure, like crazy items that I, I didn't exist in my world prior to this. So it changes all the time. And the fun part about kind of what we've built is our goal with building the platform is making it really easy to buy and sell. So it like promotes almost like peer to peer liquidity. So it allowed me to kind of live the watch world I want also as a, a founder, right? Like I get to see all these cool things, but I'm also living a founder's lifestyle. Like I'm not living this lavish life. Like we're grinding and we're building the business, but I can buy a couple watches a year and then I can sell those watches that year and I can trade into something else. And it allows me to feel like my collection is quite large despite only, you know, keeping five of these things at a time kind yeah. of thing. So what are your top five? Or what, what's on Ever? your list? What's on your list that's coming? What would you? What's a stretch goal? Oh man! Well, not not the not, not the Tiffany Nautilus. Oh, I yeah. can't imagine. I, by the way, I was at a wedding, sun, New Year's. Yeah. And a guy had it. Yeah. And I was well, like, he could have got it retail too. And and, and Tiffany he, he is a collector. The this was like his third Nautilus. Yeah, but still, like, yeah. so the retail on it is like you know, me, like sub six figures. The Jay Z approved one is a million. <laughs> <laughs> they're all, well, they're just like, they're, if they trade in the secondary market, right? That's how these watches work, right? Like even just a normal Nautilus, like a, the 5711A, like the, the, the one you see all the time with the blue dial, it's discontinued, but like that watch trades at an insane premium for what it used to trade in retail. Or like a Rolex Daytona, for example, it's a $15,000 watch at retail, trades at 30, right? So they just, a lot of them do this. As far as like my watches that I love right now, I like Royal Oaks a lot, wearing a Royal Oak right now. I'm a big Royal Oaks guy. The watch that got me hooked in this whole process was I, I was buying a, it's called the Hulk. It's just the green Sabariner. Um, it was like the first watch that I ever bought. And it was like the coolest thing ever. What I really want, Everybody I probably- Everybody loves that watch. That, people talk about that watch a lot. The Hulk? Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. it's just like- It's a cool watch. It's a, yeah. It just doesn't take itself seriously. I, thought, I was like, if I'm gonna buy my first watch, it needs to like <laughs> be cool, but it needs to like, I don't know, be like, I'm not like, I think Dia, wore, Dia from Ventum Racing wore that watch on our podcast. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a, yeah, he was like eyeing it for a while. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. And he totally embodies everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, a, it's a fun approach to, it doesn't take itself seriously. It's great. It plays if you're in a resort on the beach, you know, I like to be at the beach <laughs> and surfing and like running to the beach every morning and things like that. So I also like to wear my watches. We have a photographer on staff and, and he came into the office to shoot everyone's watches and all the watches we had going through to like create content. And he looked at my Hulk and got it under like a ton of magnification and took photos. And he was like, this is the most disgusting watch 
I have ever seen. And I was like, hell yeah. Cause I like, t- I like go to the beach with it and That's I like hilarious. wear it. And these are like, they're tool watches and they're made for that. And yeah. it's prohibitive now because it like they go up in value and you start to be like, holy shit. Like I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't jump in the ocean. Anymore, right. <laughs> yeah, you but then you like, salt water on it, yeah. you swap it out. So I, I, I tend to, to bias towards watches that like I can wear every single day. I have like a, I think my next watch that I purchase in the next month or two will probably be the, the white gold Daytona on Oyster Flex. I think it's like a super cool one. I really love the Palm Dial Datejust right now just because it's like very playful and fun and doesn't take itself seriously. I don't have a Patek in my collection. So I think that's probably one of the next ones. That's but, awesome. Yeah. Well, what can you tell people what's on the horizon? Are you going to close out 2024? Just 2024 started. Was, Here we go. Big year for everybody. 2023. I forgot what year we're in. 2023 was a, was a big growth year for us. I think we just announced we 7 x year over year in, in Q4, which is super exciting. We had very similar growth in Q3. So we're in a really awesome place from that. I think about the last year from us as really like foundation building, like we had to play the watch game, figure out how to, you know, find the buy side, the sell side, connect the two, how can we be really efficient about that? Yeah. I think we're in a really good place where like we've kind of established that we are the best place to, to buy and sell that way. And now it's like, what are the crazy things we can do to really innovate the space? So we have auctions dropping this month. So I'm, I'm not even, I haven't talked to PR about dropping that, but here we are. That's a marketplace play. Um, I mean, that makes sense. Exactly. So yeah, we're very excited about that. We're announcing Jay Balvin as a strategic investor, which is super exciting. Just embodies like the Massive. cool fact of, totally. of watches and fashion and the crossover. Our whole ambition always was like, how do we build out the modern brand and the secondary watch market? How do we build out a brand that like you'd want to wear on your hat that's the same way that like a goat exists in the world today. And so having folks like that around the cap table and jumping on is is super, super exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, a lot of growth. We're US only right now. So the next year I think, you know, international is a particularly interesting conversation. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of really exciting stuff. But it's it's pretty it's you know it's super fun. Is it bezel.com? Get bezel.com. Get bezel.com. Yeah. It's get bezel everywhere. Get bezel. Yeah. Quay, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it's been it. fun. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.